Hello everyone, my name is Leo and I'm going to talk about Alzet 64-bit arcs box. This talk will also feature our new ciphers called Crax and T-Rax. This is very much a teamwork with Christoph, Alex, Luan, Johan, Alexei, Veslin and Chingchu. Quite a team. In the beginning of this work was our NIST lightweight crypto submission called Sparkle. It consists of two hash functions called ESH and several authenticated encryption schemes called SHVEM. This is not the topic of the day. If you want to learn more about those, I suggest you have a look at our task paper presenting them. Instead, today I'm going to talk about ALZ. So in our NIST submissions, the core components are permutations. These permutations themselves have a core component, ALZ. So the aim of this talk is to analyze this component and thus to shed some light on the security of our candidate. Along the way, we will also show that this component can be used to construct uh, new tweakable block ciphers and new regular, regular block ciphers. The outline of this talk is thus kind of obvious. First, I'm going to talk about LZ, and then I'm going to talk about uh, the new ciphers. So, first, what is an S-box? So this is a block cipher. It operates on n bits, and it has a key kappa of a fixed length. n is usually 128, or in our case, you will see uh, 64 or 256. And uh, it's a permutation of the space of n bit permutation of n bit strings, uh, which is parameterized by a key. In practice, block ciphers uh, operate using a round function. This round function is iterated multiple times uh, using also a subkey called, uh, in this case, ki, which is XORed into the state before the round function. Uh, the round keys are derived from the master key using the key schedule, which I'm not going to talk about today. And the round function itself uh, needs to have several properties. So this was uh, the uh, findings of uh, Claude Shannon, the Claude Shannon. In a block cipher, you need to have confusion and diffusion. And these two properties, you also need to have them at the level of the round function uh, to a lesser extent. And then by iterating this round function, you get the property uh, that you need for the full cipher. The idea of confusion is actually kind of difficult to formalize. Uh, it's that the relationship between the output bits, the input bits, and the key bits has to be complicated. In practice, it means that it has to be highly nonlinear. Diffusion is simpler. It's the idea that all output bits need to depend on all key bits and all input bits. A convenient way of doing that is to use uh, what we call an S-box layer. So you're going to have small functions that operate on a small part of the state, which are applied in parallel over the full state. These will enter the confusion. For a diffusion, if we use a function which is linear, then it's, I'm not going to say easier, it's less difficult uh, to quantify um, the dependency between the outputs and the inputs. So these small functions s that are applied in parallel uh, on the state, that's the s-box. In practice, what does an s-box look like? Well, that's the s-box of the AES, the block cipher. Uh, you can specify it just using its lookup table. So in this case, it maps this, uh, the input bit string of, with eight zeros to the output bit string with uh, 0x63, etc., etc. You can also define it with a math formula, which is also the case for the AES. You can also use a uh, bit slice representation, so where each output bit is uh, effectively a Boolean function of the input bits. So here we have the S-box of uh, Ketchak. It's a five bit uh, permutation in this case, and it has this uh, nice representation. This is the case of uh, small S-boxes, which is the case uh, usually. Uh, in Ketchak, it's five bits. In the AES, it's eight bits. And these are pretty typical block sizes for S-boxes. The advantages of using uh, small S-boxes are that uh, the cryptographic properties are easy to study because computing the relevant properties for a permutation that has a small block size is computationally trivial. So if you want to compute the DDT, the LAT, or the ANF, when n is small, it's very easy. The resulting ciphers are easier to study also. That's one of the main selling points of the AES, which is that it's provably secure 
against some um, specific forms of differential and linear attacks because of the properties of the S-box and how they interact with uh, the linear layer. They are easy to implement. You can simply use a lookup and you win. Or in the case of Ketchak, you have the bit slice representation and voila. And for small block sizes, components that are basically optimal are well known and easy to implement. So the multiplicative inverse in the final field uh, has all that you need. It has a very high algebraic degree. It has very good uh, differential properties, very good linear properties. In fact, the best that we know how to achieve. So it's a solved problem to some extent. Not everything is perfect, though. Um, if you are implementing your S-Box using a lookup table, then you're going to have problems with uh, side channel attacks. And in order to use a small S-Box, you need to have a linear layer which provides strong diffusion. And that can be a bottleneck in terms of performances. So you can have a um, linear layer which is strongly aligned, like in the hash function Streebog, where the linear layer is this dense 8x8 eight eight matrix. Or you can have um, linear layers which are not aligned with the words in the S-Box, in which case it can be more efficient, but then it's more difficult to study. So for instance, when you look at uh, Ketchak, you have whole papers dedicated to the analysis of the differential properties of the permutation, uh, which are needed because you can't use arguments as simple as in the case of the AES. You have uh, alternatives to uh, structures based on small S-boxes. So you can have ciphers like uh, ChaCha or Spec or uh, hash, the hash function Blake2 uh, is the same, where you're going to have an ARCS network. Uh, so it's not S-box based, but then it can be very difficult to study. The question then uh, is if it's possible for a cipher to not use small S-boxes while still allowing strong security arguments in the style that you can have uh, when you use small S boxes. To answer this question, we need to answer an obvious question, which is what actually is an S box? Because we tend to think of them as small permutations that are implemented using their lookup tables. But now that we are defining S boxes using uh, Boolean functions, it's not really a good description, in my opinion. And since the S box is supposed to provide confusion, we need then to answer the very deep question of what is confusion in a cipher. And that will quickly lead us to very deep philosophical questions to which I won't even pretend uh, having the answer to. So um, let's see what are the properties that you need for a good S-Box. You need that they have known, very important that we know the properties, and that they be good. Obviously, you want good properties that are relevant to crypto. So differential properties, linear ones, integral algebraic properties. You want them to be good and you want to know them. That's what makes a good S-Box. And that's pretty much it, actually. You don't need to know its size. It's not really a criteria to be a good S-Box. It's the only thing you care about is that the properties are known and that they are good. The size doesn't matter to define an S-Box. And in fact, it's not a uh, an idea that we're introducing. We already have such things in uh, Saturna, where you have a 16-bit transformation, which uh, was considered like a big S-box. You have a 128-bit um, transformation in Spook, which is a bit like a small uh, block cipher, which you can see as a big S-box. And then you have four of those in parallel. And you also have the 96-bit SP-box in Gimli, which can be seen, uh, in a way, as a big S-box. So how do we design then a wide S-Box? It's more complicated because with a small S-Box that is 4 over 8 bits, you can just compute their cryptographic properties uh, using uh, standard tools. But it's not really possible for wide S-Boxes. So let's write first a scope statement of the uh, wide S-Box we wanted to build. So first, we wanted uh, our algorithms to be very good in software. It means that modular addition uh, makes sense. Modular addition is not going to be so great uh, in hardware, but on software, it's extremely efficient. So we went for an arcs structure with addition, rotation, and XOR. 
We want it to be efficient on 8, 16 and 32-bit microcontrollers. And that imposes then uh, the use of 32-bit instructions, because if we used, say, 8-bit instructions, it would have been great on 8-bit microcontrollers, but it would have sucked on 32-bit ones. On the other hand, 32-bit instructions can also be very efficient on 8-bit microcontrollers. Also, since we are in the software case, uh, we want to use parallel shifters. Uh, but then we have to use specific rotation amounts, because uh, different rotations can have different uh, cycle counts on different platforms. So we have to choose these rotations very carefully. We want the cryptographic properties to be both strong and well understood. Uh, as I said before, we want to use this as an S-Box, so we have to know what it does. And that means we're going to have to use an iterated structure because then we can leverage the literature on the analysis of block ciphers. If we build our S-Box like a small block cipher, then we can analyze it like a small block cipher, and we know how to do that. We also want then to minimize its uh, width, because if the width is not too large, then we can make some extensive experiments to ensure that our analysis is good. So we are going to stuck to two 32-bit words. So we need 32-bit wor words to be efficient on all microcontrollers, and only two of them uh, to ease our analysis. And finally, we want to have diffusion that is as fast as possible uh, inside the S-Box. And in practice, it's going to mean that we want to use different rotations in each round. So instead of having an, ide an identical round, which is uh, repeated several times, there is going to be slight modifications in the rounds. This will complicate the analysis, but it will significantly increase the efficiency. So from this scope statement, we got an outline. And now from this outline, this is what we get. So something very simple with just three operations, an addition of a rotation, a XOR of a rotation, and the addition of the XOR of a round constant. Questions remain, how many rounds do we need? So how many iterations of that? What are the rotation amounts that we need? Uh, these rotation amounts will decide the cryptographic properties as well as the implementation properties. So we have to choose them very carefully. And also what sort of round constants do we want? Of course, we are going to want to pick the best constants and rotation amounts. And to pick the best, it means that we have an optimization problem, and then we need to have criteria to optimize for. So one of them is that ALZ uh, has to help prevent differential attacks. So this is the quantity we need to modify in, uh, to optimize in this context. It's the maximum over all possible alpha and beta, where alpha is not 0, of the probability that ALZ maps a difference equal to alpha to a difference equal to beta. This is very standard uh, in symmetric crypto. In practice, since ALZ operates on 64 bits, we cannot compute this quantity. Instead, we are going to estimate it. And we are going to do it, again, in a way which is very standard in symmetric crypto, which is that we're going to look at the best differential trail. So that's a sequence uh, of differences that will lead alpha from alpha to beta. So this probability, it's about the maximum taken over all possible delta 1, delta 2, and delta 3 of this product. Assumptions are being made in the background. So allow me to open a parenthesis to discuss those uh, for a few seconds. The first assumption is the um, assumption that we can just multiply these probabilities, uh, meaning that they are independent. A priori, it's not the case but it's a standard assumption to make in symmetric crypto. Usually, it's the Markov assumption. We rely on the uh, addition of uh, subkeys to have more confidence in the fact that it holds. But we're, our, when we look at uh, permutation with permutations with a fixed key, as is the case here, we do not have key additions. But we can still make this assumption and then see how it works in practice. That's how it's usually done. This also relies on the assumption that the probability is dominated by a single trail. Assumptions mean verification. So we need to verify if these hold uh, experimentally. And we have, and they do. To make a long story short, the probabilities are indeed independent. Uh, I mean, act as if they were independent. And uh, the probability is indeed dominated by that of a single trail. So all is well and good. And I can just close the parenthesis 
and we have that this approximation is true. This doesn't mean that the work is done, far from it. Then we need to find a way to estimate, uh, to, to compute this maximum. And uh, to achieve this, we have used uh, Matsui style tree search to find the best uh, differential trail or differential trails if there are several of them. We have done the same type of analysis for the linear case. In this case, it's not based on a Matsui search. We have used a SAT solver. We have repeated this analysis for many different uh, sets of rotations, and we have picked the sets of rotations that were the best from an implementation standpoint. So those that have a very small distance to multiples of 8, think uh, 0, 1, 7, 8, 9, etc. And then we have picked those with the best uh, differential probabilities and linear correlations, so the lowest. So that's what you have in this table. Uh, here is the set of rotations for Alz. These are uh, minus logarithm the differential probabilities, uh, the estimate I described before, and below it's for linear correlation. So the higher the number, uh, the better. And uh, for comparison, we have also put uh, the, these quantities for the block the 64-bit block cipher spec. When the numbers are in blue, like this 24 here, it means that we have a bound, so we know that the probability cannot be higher than 2 to the minus 24, but actually maybe the highest possible is 2 to the minus 25. We are not sure, but we are, are certain that it's at most 2 to the minus 24. And that's how we got LZ. We have picked the best uh, set of rotations, and that's the one that is pictured on the, on the right uh, of the screen. So 31, 24, etc., etc. I won't go over the specifics of how we have chosen uh, the round constants, because that would take me very far. But uh, we have found that if we use the same constant uh, in each round, then it's fine. And we have cho chosen them carefully to optimize uh, even further the linear properties. So in the end, the results for Alz are as follows. Basically, it kind of behaves like uh, an AES round. So one iteration of Alz has similar uh, differential and linear properties, and two iterations of Alz have similar properties to two rounds of AES. So that's one uh, super S box in this case. We have looked at many other attacks beyond differential and linear. We have also looked at integral attacks uh, that would leverage the division property, and we have found that they can not cover more than six rounds. We have looked at invariance, linear ones, but also nonlinear ones, and we have found them not to really be an issue. Uh, the algebraic degree increases very quickly because uh, modular addition has a high algebraic degree. And uh, as I mentioned before, we could make some experiments to see if there was a big clustering of the differential trails. So many differential trails with the same starting point, the same end point, but different values in the middle. This is something which is observable but uh, nothing to be worried about. And indeed, the very fact that we could make these experiments uh, is a nice aspect uh, of Alzet. As for the name, well, this is Luxembourg. Uh, if you don't really see where that is, these are the neighbors, uh, France, Belgium, and Germany. The Alzet is this blue thing down the middle. It's a river. And uh, you have a picture of Alzet taken in Luxembourg City, just under my face. Esh is the name of the hash function. And uh, because it's very close to the University of Luxembourg, which is based in Esh sur Alzet, Alzet being the name of the river. So that's why. What more can we do with Alzet? Well, we can design new block ciphers, possibly with a tweak. So first, let's look at a very simple way of building a block cipher using a 64-bit uh, arcs box. So if I give you a 64-bit S-box and I ask you to build a 64-bit block cipher, how do you do it? Think of the simple, simplest structure, and I'm going to give you some time. So very straightforward. You just take a master key that you got in two halves, you saw the first half, apply the arcs box, saw the second half, apply the arcs box, and repeat. 
there is just a small issue if you do that, which is that you might have uh, what we call slide attacks, and so to prevent it, you just store a round counter. And that's it. That's what we call cracks. But this is a round structure. We still need to give a number of steps. So uh, this is a um, block cipher, EK. Um, how would an attack work in practice? So how do attacks work against block ciphers? You have a distinguisher in the middle. So it's a property of the cipher that you would not expect from a random permutation. And you have that in center rounds, and you are going to try and reach these uh, center rounds by guessing part of the keys from the bottom and from the top. So if you want to avoid attacks, you want to prevent the existence of a distinguisher with a complexity uh, that you would find worrying. And you need to prevent uh, an attacker from, from reaching the distinguisher in the middle rounds through key guessing. So you're going to compute the number of rounds that are needed to prevent all the distinguishers you know about and care about, and the number of rounds that is needed uh, for all bits of the state to depend on all the bits of the key. The first is RE, the second is RD, and then the number of rounds is basically two times RD to prevent key guessing plus RE to prevent distinguishers. And to be safe, you don't quite do that. You also allow for possible improvements in uh, the cryptanalysis of the cipher and you don't use one times one time re you do it one plus eta times re where eta is a security factor and that's cracks so a cracks is a cute bird with a very nice haircut and in our case uh, it's a 64-bit block cipher with a 128-bit key a very simple key schedule and given the parameters uh, we have and a security factor of 20%, we have that we need 10 rounds. Cracks is extremely lightweight. So this is a full implementation of cracks. You can compile it, that's valid C code. That's the cracks en encryption in full. We have made some optimized implementation on uh, microcontrollers and we have compared them with the best implementations we are aware of, of uh, several lightweight block ciphers. Uh, this table is in the full version of uh, the paper, the one which is on ePrint. And as you can see, cracks is extremely good, uh, especially in terms of RAM. So the RAM usage uh, for in both encryption and decryption is four times lower than the second best. And since we don't really have a key schedule, uh, this one is free compared to others. It's also very small and very fast. So, pretty good lightweight block cipher, which you might uh, consider using if you need such a thing. But what if you don't need a lightweight block cipher, but instead something much bigger? In other words, can you use a white S box in another way than the trivial one, which consists in just iterating it? Can you go beyond, so we would call this kind of structure, even Mansoor in symmetric crypto? Well, yes, you can. Uh, that's what we call the long trade strategy. So that's something we introduced uh, when we designed Sparks in 2016, if I remember correctly. And the long trade strategy is a design strategy which allows you to leverage wider S-boxes. So if you have an S-box which needs several iterations to offer good cryptographic properties like LZ does, then it's better to avoid full diffusion in one round because since your S-box is like a diesel engine, it needs time to get started, it's better to leave it some time to do its thing on its branch and then try to, to interact with it. So it's a principle which allows us to use a wide S-box and then we'll see why we would want to use wide S-boxes. So this idea of letting the S-box do its thing, in practice, it means that you're going to have an SPN structure, a classical one, with a layer of S-boxes and then a linear layer for diffusion. What's specific is that the linear layer will be itself built like a faster network. So, like you can see on the pictures. Why is it nice? Let's look at 
two steps. So when you have two steps, uh, that's what it looks like. What it looks like, and you know for a fact that uh, the some of the differences will have to go through two iterations uh, of your Y desk box. So of LZ in our case. So we know that as soon as a difference enters here, it will have to go through a double arcs box. And that means that the probability of this trail will be at most 2 to the minus uh, 32 in the case of LZ, which is very low. And you won't uh, be able to leverage uh, some hypothetical clustering that you could have because the difference, the value of the difference here is fixed since you are tapping the value here to store it on the other side. Same holds when you have more branches, especially in this case. Uh, this, given the definition of L prime that we have used, is uh, an MDS layer. So it also provides strong diffusion. Long trace strategy, how to use wireless boxes to build uh, block ciphers. And the TRAX round function is as follows. So that's just um, a 256-bit uh, version where you have four 64-bit branches. And you add the tweak directly. So you have a key addition, which is not represented with a complex key schedule in this case. But the tweak is just cut in two halves of uh, 64 bits each. And you have the first half, which goes here, and the second half, which goes here. The tweak is added every second round, every second step, not at every step because it turns out to give us a better bounds. What kind of bound, you ask? Give me some time. So how do we justify the security of a cipher built in this way? Why is this a nice way to build a cipher uh, at all? So let's look at truncated trails. A uh, truncated trail is a differential trail where you only care about whether uh, the part of the state is active or not. So you don't care about the value, you just want to know if it's active or not. So for each S box, you want to know if it has a non-zero difference in, in its input or not. So if you have L S boxes, then you have two to the L uh, possibilities per step. Each S box is active or not, that's two possibilities and you have two to the L. So if you have S steps to take into account, that gives you a total of two to the power L times S. So in the case of AES-128, which is a um, 10-round cipher with an 8-bit test box where you have 16 of them applied in parallel, that gives you a search, search space of size 2 to the 160. You're not going to enumerate all of those, so you can reduce this number to some extent using the properties of the linear layer. So not all transitions are possible from round to round to the next. So you can use that to reduce the search space significantly. But what you can do is use wide box to reduce, and I mean reduce, the search space. In the case of the AES-128, if you were using uh, LZ as your S-box, then you wouldn't have 2 to the 16 possibility in each step. You would have 2 to the power 2, which is quite significant. The, what this means is that if you have an algorithm which uses wide S-boxes, like TRAX, then you can enumerate all truncated traits. You can just loop over all of them. It's practical. It's practical and it's actually quite fast. You don't need a cluster to do that. And what you can do, for instance, and that's the idea of the long trail strategy, is to enumerate all traits. And then for each of them, you compute a bound on the probability of the differential and then you pick the best, the worst bound you have found over all the possible traits, and that's a bound for the whole cipher. That's the idea of the long trail argument. What happens when you add a tweak? So a tweak is kind of like a key uh, which is public, but not in the public key crypto sense, if that makes sense. So you have a tweakable block cipher has uh, three inputs, the plain text, the key, as before, and the tweak. The tweak kind of acts like a key, but which you can assume is under the control of the adversary. So not only does the adversary know it, maybe they can even choose it, which gives a new venue for attack, because then the adversary can inject differences through the tweak. So how do we handle this from a block cipher design's perspective? 
it's actually very easy when you have a cipher designed using the long trail strategy because you can you could enumerate all the differential trade the truncated differential trades before well in our case when you add a tweak that's only two new inputs that you need to consider in every step which is really not that much so you can use the same approach as before you just make a small well i'm not going to say tweak you just make a small modification which is that the tweak can uh, cancel or maybe add um, new branches to your truncated tray. And, th and um, what this means is that the related tweak security is very easy to assess uh, both from a conceptual and from a computational standpoint when you have a cipher with wide S boxes, which is built using the long trail strategy. So we have gone from how do you build a wide S-box to how do you build a cipher using a wide S-box? And now, finally, why do you want to build a cipher with a wide S-box? And one of the reasons why you want to do that is that it gives you very easy security arguments in the related tweak setting. So we have done just that. TRAX L is a family of, uh, is a tweakable block cipher, sorry. So we have taken the round function uh, that I have showed you before uh, added a key schedule to it to handle the master key. The tweak is just sorted into the state every second step because we have found that we got the best uh, bounds when the tweak was added every second step. It has a 256-bit key, a 128-bit tweak, a 256-bit block size, and using the same type of analysis as before, we have found that it needs uh, 17 steps we have put a bound on the query complexity of the attacks. So an attacker can um, try as many keys as they want, but they cannot use more than 102 to the power 128 um, known or chosen plain texts. That's the idea. So it's just not realistic uh, to allow the adversary to query a keyed oracle as many times as they want and doing so would lead us to use too many steps in the primitive, so we have chosen to give it a very, very conservative bound uh, and work from there. Uh, why you, would you want to do that? Uh, with a wide tweakable block cipher, you can do some uh, nice things because you have, uh, at this stage, quite mature modes of operation that need a tweakable block cipher, which are uh, parallelizable, but then the well, problem you could have is that usually their security is in a birthday bound, follows the birthday bound on the block size. So the bigger the block size, uh, the bigger the security. Hence, uh, the need for a wide clickable block cipher, which T-Rex uh, provides you. Time to wrap up. So LZ, which is uh, the key component of the Sparkle permutations, which are themselves the key components of our NIST uh, lightweight crypto submissions, has well understood, which is uh, what we want an SBOX to have, and strong cryptographic properties. So this provides um, new light, more light uh, on the analysis of uh, this NIST candidate. LZ can also be used to build a lightweight block cipher, which is arguably at least as light as uh, spec. It can also be used to build a wide tweakable block cipher, which will allow you, since the modes are parallelizable, to better use uh, vector instructions. And also, uh, the wider block size is uh, very interesting for people who work on post-quantum symmetric crypto. So that's another context in which tracks uh, could be useful. And maybe in your own design. That's a 64-bit test box. If you need such a thing, then just go ahead and use it. Finally, I urge you to uh, not miss the talk on improved differential linear attacks with applications to ARC ciphers, which deals with the uh, cryptanalysis of ARC-based ciphers, which uh, those using LZ very much are. And it's a paper by uh, Christoph Beyerle and his co-authors, Christoph being a co-author of this one. So be sure to, to check this one out. And with that, I thank you.